this is the first JCI forum that is co-sponsored with the Institute for Chinese Studies at University of Malaya and the East Asia Studies Caucus at University of Bangsaan, Malaysia. The first speaker will be Peter. Peter, stand up so that we don't think you're petered out. Thank you. <laughs> and the second speaker is uh, Dr. Shahada Jamit. So in line with the tradition of rose among thorns, the first speaker will be Peter, the second will be Shahada, and the third will be my humble self. So please. <laughs> All right, today um, I'm very glad that uh, Professor Wu Wing Tai, a good friend of mine, has invited me to, uh, uh, to this uh, panel to share my views and observations about uh, Chinese political development uh, under Xi Jinping. All right, so um, basically I'm going to share some views about uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, of course, he is, uh, many people have termed his term uh, Xi Jinping as the most powerful uh, leader of China since uh, Mao Zedong probably on par with Deng Xiaoping and even surpassing. I think there is a certain degree of truth in it and I basically agree that he is uh, way more powerful than his uh, two predecessors, but that doesn't mean that he is uh, without uh, significant uh, challenges and risk. Right? And later I will show you what has basically happened under the five years under his watch and how he has consolidated his power and what are the signs of those. And increasingly this uh, centralization of power could also mean increasing risks and costs to the political system. And uh, in recent months, uh, there are certain signs, we are not sure how credible they are, that there's certain pushback against uh, C's uh, centralization of power. All right, uh, but before that, we need to understand basically certain basic features of Chinese uh, political system. As this is a public lecture, I think that I should make uh, some basic explanation of the Leninist party state, which is very different from many of the political systems that we are familiar with, right? The democratic system, parliamentary, or uh, the presidential system uh, type, generally, we know how they operate, like we know how our parliament functions, we know how our cabinet is formed. But for the Chinese system, because it's opaque and because it's op it operates on a very different principles, sometimes it, people uh, do not necessarily grasp the immediate significance of the term party state. Right? So I will basically provide certain basic uh, features of the party states. Um, I won't call today's China's Communist is ruled by a Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it still have communist uh, institutions, certainly, uh, but then I think the better term is called it Leninist. Leninist in the sense that um, it takes away the economics uh, because I, uh, I think many people will recognize China is more capitalist than most capitalist countries. So basically, um, it is the Leninist Party state in which the top party leaders as uh, they will basically at the same time serving as the state president, premier, chairman of Central Military Commission. That is the top organization in charge of the military, the chair of National People's Congress. There is the legislature and so on. Now on the surface, this seems like exactly what also similar with other parliamentary system, right? The ruling party is also in charge of the premier, you know, the head of the legislature and so on and so forth. Um, but it's the Chinese system is that this is not just certain personnel overlap. It is a parallel structure in which the party overshadow the state. That is the essence of the Leninist uh, party state. Right? So at the provincial and local levels, uh, the party officials also concurrently serve as officials of the government and the party has to make the power to make all the state's most important personnel and policy decisions. And notwithstanding the party's leading decision-making role, while many discussions and institutions have to go through or take, take place through government institutions, not CCP organizations, yet that doesn't take away the leading role of the party. Right? So the party is organizationally um, much more, how should I say? Well, the, basically the state is infused to the party. Right? That is the, 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 the way to look at it. All right. So we have to look at the party itself as the key institution. All right, this is uh, from the okay uh, the most uh, recent uh, 
uh, central com uh, uh, the what they call the party uh, the most recent party congress, um, which is in two November two zero one seven. All right, at the moment China. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has about 90 million party members. Uh, I was told that it's actually not the largest party in the world, that the ruling party of India, BJP, has surpassed CCP in terms of party members. Uh, but I actually have not verified that, but uh, apparently that is the case. So every five years, they will have a national uh, party Congress uh, every five years. So the last time is in November 2017, in which the party Congress we choose about 250 central committee members. This is the key, uh, in accordingly, accordingly, the highest organ of authority in which they will meet once a year over its five-year term. Um, that is called plenum. Um, actually, this is not exactly correct. It can meet more than once, right? But uh, I will show you later what does it mean. And then from here, you choose the 24 Politburo members seven members of the Politburo Standing Committee, and then on top of this is the General Secretary Xi Jinping. So these are the kind of the hierarchy, the pyramids. Um, among the, um, all right, so National Public Congress of CCP, once in five years for two weeks generally. So the last is in October, I'm sorry, not November, October 2017, uh, the 19 Party Congress. So with about 2020, 2,287 delegates uh, elected from 40 constituencies. Uh, the term elected here doesn't really mean democratic elections, right? It's basically handpicked by the party uh, in terms of these uh, delegates uh, from the 40 constituencies, and they will have some retired party leaders that invited delegates, and then the National Party Congress will elect the Central Committee, the Central Disciplinary Instruction Commission, and so on and so forth, right? As I uh, mentioned just now, how does it work, right? Um, this number is never fixed, right? It can be more or less uh, uh, around 2,000 and plus. So that is to retain certain degree of flexibility. So unlike our parliament is fixed at 222, uh, this number is really never fixed. So as all these numbers actually, it's by convention now, Politburo is 25. Um, 10 years ago, the Politburo Standing Committee was nine, right? and, and then reduced to seven. But it's never really fixed. It can enlarge or it can uh, reduce the number, right? And same with the others. Okay. So the Central Committee, it convenes at least one meeting per year called plenum or plenary session. So attended by all uh, CC full and alternate members and other invited participants, but they have no voting rights if you are only invited. Now, in general, these are the patterns. The seven plenum, so as I say, it's not within a five year, once in a year. Uh, it can be twice, and it actually has already happened that this year they have uh, two times uh, the plenum. But each plenum, generally speaking, serves a certain function, but not all the time. Remember, these are not fixed. The Chinese Communist rule basically has certain degree of flexibility that, uh, that you cannot establish certain uh, uh, laws that you can say is permanent, right? But in general, the first and second plenum is about sorting out the party and state personnel appointments. Generally, the, the first one is about the party, all the top positions, followed by the state, all the uh, important positions. And then third plenum, generally speaking, is about calling for a comprehensive uh, program of the current generation of leader. That's why most of the major reform initiatives uh, well, announced in the third plenum. It generally generally takes place in the spring of the second year after the uh, party congress has been held, right? And the fourth plenum devoted to party building or rule of law. The fifth plenum, plenum most of the time, uh, is almost definite that it's about the five-year plan, right? That will be uh, submitted to the state legislature in the following year. Uh, the sixth plenum is about cultural policy. The seventh plenum will be about the preparation of the next party congress. And in between these plenums can also serve the functions of changing the personnel in terms of up and down of the people, of the important officials. Some people, some officials get purged, some have been promoted. So that will happen in between the seven plenums. All right. So the Politburo 25, um, the t on top is the seven, and then the 25, there's the next level of important people. Um, so who get elected, what criterion, on what basis? 
again, they are never published uh, institutionalized, institutionalized rules in the form of published written requirements. We basically observe, based on the past uh, patterns, what are some of the general unwritten rules. Age uh, is certainly one. It's related to succession. But one thing is interesting about Xi Jinping is that he's breaking a lot of the rules that we have observed in the past that we thought is going to be a fixed rule, but it's actually is being revised or changed or abandoned uh, by uh, Xi Jinping. And basically, the composition of the Politburo will have to uh, be a balance of provincial leaders, central government leaders, and military leaders. All right. uh, age, uh, so, uh, just now I forgot, provinces, um, generally speaking, uh, the four major uh, big cities, so-called cities, they are sometimes it's actually at the provincial level, will have a rep representation in the Politburo. That means the party secretary of Beijing, Tianjin, Chongqing, and uh, Shanghai, right, will uh, be in the Politburo plus two. Um, one is Guangdong. Uh, Guangdong, why is in the Politburo? Because Guangdong um, is the largest province with, in terms of GDP. And the other one is Xinjiang, right? Xinjiang is the key of China's internal stability. So the party secretaries of these six provinces, uh, in, according to our observations, it has been in the Politburo in the, oh, so, okay, speed up. Get to the crisis. Get to the crisis. <laughs> All right, so these are basically some of the rules. All right, I just count uh, the most recent Politburo uh, in terms of who has visited Malaysia. Ten of them have visited Malaysia in the past decades. All right, so these are the most current, these are the, se uh, the six and seven uh, Politburo Standing Committee until Han Zhen, and from now, these are the people who serve in the Politburo, right? And you can see they are Guangdong, Shanghai, you know, some uh, vice premier representing central military uh, leaders, uh, central government leaders or military leaders or provincial government officials, right? As I say, you know, uh, uh, Xinjiang, Chongqing, and so on and so forth, all right? So, okay. Uh, and then Politburo Standing Committee, right, with division of labor, highest leadership. Um, these are the current uh, seven one. They are all in charge of certain basic things, right? And together it's called a collective leadership. In a sense, it's one person, one word. That as powerful as Xi Jinping is, supposedly in, the, in terms of making decision, it's still one person, one vote. Um, the meeting frequency of Politburo Standing Committee is not disclosed. The, the Politburo is about once a month. The Central com Committee is about, as I say, the seven times generally uh, in a year, uh, but we could, Assume, but not never confirm that it is once a week, right? So these are the seven Politburo Standing Committee uh, with the top two, and then the five, five of these five people are just recently promoted um, in last year's uh, Politburo, uh, last year uh, 19 parties Congress, right? And then the General Secretary is uh, the first among the equal. Um, I think all of you are aware that there has been this controversy about the removing of term limits. That refers to the state presidency. The general secretary, this position actually never has a term limit, right? It's, 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 uh, it's always uh, without a term limit. Uh, but usually the people, the person holding this one will be holding the chairmanship of the military commission and the state presidency is called the Trinity of Officers. So it's the state presidency that actually has some kind of institution limitations in terms of term limit, not these two positions. But because it's the Trinity of Officers, this one will impose basically term limits on these other two informally. right? But now since he removed it, we can assume that uh, Xi Jinping is planning to have a longer stay in power, all right? And then, of course, he's, he has also created a lot of leadership, small groups, uh, central commissions, uh, in order to centralize a lot more uh, powers, all right? So these are the central leadership small groups that under Xi Jinping, uh, which has been created, and almost all of them are the leader is Xi Jinping, right? So this is a, a basic summary of uh, what, what, what is going on in terms of the central level uh, political uh, centralization of power. All right, the state presidency, the state council, right? The, the presidency and vice presidency actually are symbolic roles. 
the state president is somewhat akin to our Agong. There's no real function in it. Right? But because Xi Jinping assumed the state presidency and his general secretary, that empower the office of the state presidency. And the innovation of Xi Jinping is the promotion of Wang Qishan as the vice president. Wang Qishan, by convention, according to the H rule that I just spoke about, he's supposed to retire by now. Uh, but Wang Qishan, he has uh, passed H limit, uh, but uh, Xi Jinping still appoint him to the vice uh, president position. All right, okay, I will skip this. And then the state council is the Chinese cabinet, like our cabinet. Now, one of the things um, the, they, ha, they, are, they are big in terms of the ministries, commissions, and then uh, in terms of the number of ministers, and not just ministers, they have state councillors in which uh, there is no correspondence in our system. All right? But anyway, the important thing is that the main body of power in China is the Politburo. The main government institution is the state council, the cabinet. But if you look at the personnel, only five members of the state state council serve in the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Com Committee. If you follow the part hierarchy, that means that the state council, in terms of formal um, party hierarchy, is one step lower than the uh, Politburo. All right. So, um, okay, what happened under Xi Jinping in the past five years? Uh, one of the most significant, significant uh, achievement. I call this achievement uh, because it's something very remarkable, is the PLA reforms. Uh, reforming the, the organizational structure of the PLA is not an easy feat. In December 2015, uh, he, he announced this reform that is carried uh, over in the 2016, 2017, and by now basically completed. Um, there are three components of these reforms. First is the uh, organizational reform in terms of the uh, the organization under the Central Military Commission. The second is the service branch reforms uh, in terms of um, organizing a new kind of service branch. And the third is about the force deployment, reorganizing the military uh, command system. That reform is the most drastic reform in the history of the People's Republic since 1949, right? And in that sense, he truly achieved something remarkable. Because the Chinese military, the PLA, was modeled after the Soviet Union system, right? It is very ill adapted to today's modern warfare um, that emphasizes a lot of joint connectivity between the different branches, mobility, and the use of uh, modern communications uh, system. While what Xi Jinping has done in terms of the PLA reform is to actually model after the US, after the US system. Right, to change the, 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 the traditional Soviet system to the US system. So basically, um, that is one part of it. Um, the first part is about the organization. And I say, before the reform, there are the so-called four big departments, general staff, general political, general logistic, and equipment development. Um, among these four, the first two are basically havens for corruption, military corruption. And Xi Jinping has taken down a lot of corrupt military generals most of them come from these two uh, departments. Uh, so he has basically splintered these four into 15 smaller organizations, reducing their power, streamlining their functions, and in a way also make them more efficient and more focused in the work they do and reducing corruption. The second is to organize the service branch. Before the reform, the PLA has no ground force or slash army headquarters. It only has Navy, Air Force, and then there's a second artillery, meaning the rocket missile force, right? Now, that setup actually um, underprivileged the Navy and Air Force because their rank as a commander of the whole Navy is about the same with any army general because there's no separate army headquarter. Now, they create a new, they call it ground force headquarter, in a way, lowering the importance of the army and elevating the importance of the Navy and the Air Force. And the second artillery has been uh, reorganized as a rocket force in charge of nuclear missiles, basically. And it created the fifth uh, uh, force. It's called the Strategic Support Force, uh, basically informational warfare. Right. So this is the second reform. And the third is to reorganize seven military regions into five uh, command areas. It's a little bit like the US command area, US at the Indo-Pacific Command. Now they just uh, 
Africa Command, right? And then the the um uh the Eastern Hemisphere, and then recently they just uh, announced the putting back the second fleet. Basically, is to model after that one, all right? But this is rather than the global, it's just still uh, within the China, the five command areas. So smashing the vested interest within the military and leadership over key military reforms. The second signs of uh, Xi Jinping consolidating power is a reshuffling of provincial leaders. And there is an intensified reshuffling in 2016, 2017. And I recently count the last time I count is that none of the provincial leaders now serve more than six or seven years. This is remarkable because during Jiang and Hu, you will see certain provincial party secretaries serving for more than 10 years, meaning that they become kind of an entrenched local warlord, so to speak. But this has basically gone. Uh, there's no more uh, party secretaries who serve in the same province for, for a very long time. Uh, the rise of new factions, the decline of old factions, basically, um, Xi Jinping seemed to command uh, the loyalty of most of his uh, supposedly his adversaries, but actually this could be uh, quite fragile, right? If we think the serious signs of uh, pushing back seriously. Um, anyway, um, he is promoting people he trusts, uh, people he worked with during his years as leaders in Fujian, Zhejiang, Shanghai, Central Party Schools. Uh, some of them stand out as uh, central technocrat, especially those who came from the aerospace industry. Right, the one famous uh, Shanghai gang affiliated with Jiang Zemin apparently has been released, uh, has been smashed. Right, enhanced uh, party discipline. Um, it is not a good time to be a party official during Xi Jinping era, basically you can say that uh, uh, there have been a lot more rules, very vigilant rules governing the party's uh, members' uh, behavior and the officials. You can see all these rules that have come up under uh, his rule. And of course, there is a famous anti-corruption campaign. Um, it is a political campaign. Uh, it is a political campaign in terms of um, getting rid of people he doesn't like and promoting the people he likes. Uh, but that doesn't take away that the campaign also have institutional effects in the sense of, uh, of reducing the abuse of power, reining in the, the bureaucracy's uh, problem, and reducing corruption. And it has, has a form of institutionalization in the creation of this National Supervisionary Commission just created this year. And the power of this commission is very large. And people are worried that it will be subject to abuses of power uh, yet. Uh, but this is how uh, the party sees that this is a way of uh, reining in uh, corruption in the party. Um, Xi Jinping seems to have stronger control over economic policy. Traditionally speaking, the party secretary will delegate economic policy to the premier. Right, like during the time of Li Keqiang, uh, uh, Wen Jiabao and then Zhu Rongji. Uh, but Li Keqiang seems to be marginalized. And Xi Jinping uh, seems to trust his own uh, chief economic advisor more than uh, his uh, premier. And then judicial reform. Uh, there is a lot more uh, way to reform the judiciary in order to reduce uh, abuses of power. Many of the social problems in China be happened because of the judicial um, the local judicial political collusion, right? So he's trying to centralize the control of the judiciary to reduce the local abuses of power, all right? And last but not least uh, is the tightening of ideological and political control. Uh, so now uh, China today is less open in terms of intellectual freedom compared to five years ago. So, right? He has enacted a number of laws uh, during his time to uh, take tighter control of this, uh, this freedom. All right, so this is basically what happened uh, under C. I won't say I exhaust all the things that has happened in terms of politics and policies, but I think I cover a major chunk of it. And when I say Xi Jinping broke certain, uh, break certain rules, this is very apparent uh, in the party congress last year and the state legislation that uh, there was uh, Call upon in this year March. First thing, he did not name a successor. There is no apparent successor. Um, each generation since the end of Deng Xiaoping, there is a very clear successor. Like Jiang Zemin has a successor in Hu Jintao, Hu Jintao successor in Xi Jinping. That has not happened. There is no clear uh, sign who is the successor. Now Xi Jinping um, 
that is related to the age factor. I have no time to go over this, but basically, Xi Jinping thinks that this is a problematic pattern uh, because I think in his own view, he experienced why a successor system uh, is going to reduce the effectiveness of governance in China. He, basically, I think he um, take the years of Hu Jintao as a serious, uh, how should I, ref I, okay, I rephrase it that the starting point of analyzing Xi Jinping should be Hu Jintao, right? Why and what happened? Now, during Hu Jintao's time, China achieved vast economic growth, but there were also signs that Hu Jintao was a relatively conservative, not in terms of ideology, but in terms of uh, his uh, ideas, his vision is relatively very modest, did not have any big vision, and he did not dare to challenge vested interests. So, especially after 2008, there were signs that the central government was losing control of uh, the bureaucracy, right? And then uh, vested interests were building up, and there were no way Hu Jintao was able to deal with them. And in Xi Jinping, as I say, he was put as a successor uh, and in around 2007, uh, right? He observed clearly that in terms of the leadership system for the 10 years of Hu Jintao, the first five years he lived under the shadow of his predecessor, Jiang Zemin, in which Jiang Zemin put a lot of men around him. The next five years, he lived under the shadow of his successor, the Xi Jinping himself, that people will know that you will eventually depart, and then the next leader in line is uh, Xi Jinping. So in a way, this system, I think Xi Jinping feels that it constrains the leadership effectiveness, and therefore he wants to deal with it a bit. Therefore, you, can, you don't see uh, in 2 0 uh, two, 2017, there was a successor name. Right? How do we know this? Because we can know in terms of their age and in terms of their uh, provincial background, and then we know that there is no successor name. Does that mean that in the next five years, he won't appoint a successor? May not necessarily be the case. Right? Um, I will discuss this later. The second sign is the lifting of term limit of the state presidency, as I say, in this year's March. That is a sign that he wants to continue. First, you have no successor. Then, if you have no successor, then that shows that you want to uh, have a longer term. And the removal of the term seems to confirm that. All right. So these are all the rules that Xi Jinping has basically broken, together with others, like putting his own thought into the party constitution in the middle of the 10-year term. Right now, we're not sure it's a 10-year term or not. And then naming Wang Qishan you know, uh, as the vice president, defying the rules of age retirement, and all these things. Right, and we can uh, quite confidently say that he is breaking a lot of rules and centralized a lot of power and the creation of all these leadership small groups and commission. Now, why is he able to do that? I have the interpretation that um, it is the party that has enabled him to do it, that he is not doing it uh, because he's power hungry or something like that. Well, he could be, right? But remember, Xi Jinping is not like before that Hu Jintai and Jiang Zemin a uh, person with a strong background, if you call factions. Jiang Zemin had very strong base in the Shanghai group. Hu Jintao has a strong base in the Communist Youth League. And when Xi Jinping was put into power, actually the Western media and Japanese observers predicted that, predicted that he would be the weakest leader because it's true that he did not have any strong power base. But in the five years he had built up, and why is it the case? I think one of the reasons is that it is actually the party who has enabled him to be that powerful. And the reason they want to enable him is to deal away with certain rules, as I say, that has restricted the effectiveness of Chinese governance that has occurred during the Hu Jintao's time. So they let him do it. But now he may be overdoing it in the sense that he's inviting certain backlash. Now, what are certain signs of this? Uh, we are not sure because these are all coming from you no know, certain overseas media, but there could be certain credibility uh, because Xi Jinping, because of his tightening uh, ideological political control, I think is uh, basically um, the intellectual class is not happy. His new normal is very difficult now. The economic transition is actually not going well. 
the responsibility will be on him. And then with the US-China trade war, uh, if that actually he's not able to handle well, responsibility will be on him. And the foreign policy, later Shahada will talk. Uh, but in my view, uh, Xi Jinping made mistakes in his foreign policy in the past five years. There are achievements, but there are mistakes um, that cause certain backlash. Right? And then I think that the party will say that now you have amassed so much power, we enable you to do it, but you have not done it well, and that could create certain kind of backlash. Right? So during the Beidai Hers uh, meeting just happened, is the summer retreat of the central leadership. There have been some rumors that the old leaders are not happy with it. I'm not sure how this is true. As I say, these are rumors that cannot be verified. Um, but just by reading um, the developments, I think there is certain degree of truth. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, China is heading toward crisis, right? but it's increasing the cost or the risk of the system. If Xi Jinping fails, right, the whole Chinese uh, system will fail miserably because it's a very much centralized to him personally on the top. All right, I think that covers basically a very general observation of what has happened under Xi Jinping in the past five years. Right, so I hope that uh, uh, this doesn't disappoint you. <laughs> All right. So uh, next, I think you have Shahada or Pofu, right? Okay, um, a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, first of all, let me express my um, gratitude to the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present a paper here today. Well, I'm No Shahada Jamil from the East Asian uh, International Relations Caucus, UKM. And the topic of my presentation here today uh, would be China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping, from carrot to stick. And uh, this is the outline of my presentation, where I'll begin by giving a brief introduction on the topic, and then I'll go in depth uh, with uh, China's foreign policy uh, under Xi Jinping for both his first and also the second term. And I'll discuss a bit on the future trend before ending my presentation with a conclusion. So as we all know, ladies and gentlemen, China since the um, since the last four decades has moved from being an isolated country separated from international community to one of the world major powers. And despite its OPEC policy making process, we can actually get basic ideas on um, how its foreign policy is made based on three major indications. The first would be Chinese leaders' rhetoric, and then the second indication could be um, various CCP or Chinese government reports or publications, and the third would be Beijing's actual behavior in the international arena. And uh, as a Southeast Asian state, I think it's very important for us to really know how um, China's foreign policy is made because um, being located at the epicenter of the current global shift from the west to the, to the east, uh, we can gain you know, better understanding of what kind of power it is today and what kind of power it would be tomorrow. And this will subsequently guide us in formulating our policy in dealing with the rising giant. So for his first term, I think um, it shows both inheritance and also shift compared to what uh, Hu Jintao's foreign policy is. And in terms of inheritance, basically the policy aim is still to achieve uh, modernization by creating a stable and peaceful uh, external environment to support China's economic growth and also domestic development. And that's the reason why China needs to maintain a f uh, friendly relationships with other states. And with that in mind, C has introduced a few strategies or initiatives uh, as, uh, as listed below. The first would be the new type of relationship with major countries in the 21st century. And this is focusing uh, mostly on the Sino-US relations, where um, for China, major conflict between uh, the two of these power is not inevitable. And that such conflict will be catastrophic for both sides, with even non-cooperation would be extremely costly. And this relationship will be based on basic principles of and also which uh, means no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and also mutually beneficial. And um, the development of such relationship shows that China, China's intention is actually to be a strategic partner of the United States rather than um, enemy of the United States. And, um, where both sides will resort to dialogue and negotiation in conflict resolution, and both parties will also respect each other's core interests. For instance, um, the United States will have to respect China's core interests on the Tibet and Taiwan issues, and China, on the other hand, 
uh, will through its uh, practical actions to show that it will not challenge US hegemony in the international system. And the second uh, strategy would be the periphery diplomacy. Uh, this diplomacy is introduced by Xi Jinping during a forum on Chinese diplomacy towards the periphery held on October 2013. And the major objective is to promote friendship with China's uh, neighbors and to foster amicable, secure and prosperous neighborhood based on the principle of Qing Chen Hui Rong, uh, which can be translated into amity, sincerity, mutual benefit and inclusiveness. And ASEAN state are major components of this diplomacy. Why? Because First of all, our geographical location. And the second thing is that majority of the ASEAN states, are, majority of the South China Sea claimant states are ASEAN member states, right? So the third initiative will be the Belt and Road Initiative or better known as the BRI. Um, well, the idea actually aimed not, to on, not only to reshape global trade and connectivity via massive infrastructure development, but also to cultivate closer people to people bond between nations involved. So despite all these cooperative measures, we can also witness some shift in terms of Xi Jinping's foreign policy compared to Hu Jintao's. And uh, among these shifts include Chinese elites rising confidence about China's international status and the tendency to use more, to use more stick or assertive approach rather than carrots uh, or cooperative measures. So China's rising confidence uh, is best reflected through Xi Jinping's vision of the Chinese dream and also uh, the achievement of two centenary goals, Liang Ke Yipai Nian. And uh, meanwhile, for me, I think a clear example of Chinese assertiveness can be seen through its South China Sea policy. Because unlike uh, South, China's policy, South China Sea policy under Hu Jintao, uh, which is more technical, the form of assertiveness in uh, China's South China Sea policy under Xi Jinping actually demonstrates a uh, more strategic sense. Why would I say that? Because Chinese assertiveness in South China Sea today is no longer unorganized or triggered by incident uh, basis, uh, but it actually focuses more on to enhance its control and presence in the disputed waters. You know, um, a few example is like uh, the increased speed and skill in artificial island building in the South China Sea, and also uh, China's increased willingness to deploy the Navy and also maritime law enforcement agencies in the disputed waters. Well, during his second term, um, based on my observation, I actually think that the sign of assertiveness become more obvious and more prominent. And this is best illustrated in Xi Jinping's uh, political work report uh, delivered during the um, Chinese Communist Party 19 Party Congress in October last year. And uh, in comparison with previous report delivered by Hu in 2012, Xi Jinping's keynote speech offer a subtle but significant shift. The first is the emphasis on China's plan for national rejuvenation. And um, where Xi Jinping has vowed to achieve great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and to restore China's rightful right as a great power um, by 2049. And his determination is actually very clear because the phrase great rejuvenation has been mentioned 27 times in the report compared to only seven times during Hu's. And um, Xi Jinping even offered a more specific multi-phase plan to achieve this uh, rejuvenate, rejuvenation, where um, by 2020, this is basically domestic because uh, they aim to achieve like socialist modernization by 2020. And by 2035, it actually offers a more outward-looking agenda where Xi Jinping uh, looked forward to, um, for China to emerge as a global power in terms of uh, global leader in terms of national, comprehensive national power and also international influence. And by 2050, uh, he hoped that China will em emerge as a fully developed nation. And this multi-phase plan can also be applied in military realm, where um, by 2020, the PLA will achieve a full mechanization, by 2035, full modernization, and by 2050, PLA will emerge as a world-class army. And um, the, third, the second shift would be um, China's emphasis on its emergence as a global government governance leader, because uh, Xi has pledged that China will always be a defender of international order that supports the multilateral trading system and will promote economic globalization. And one good example in this uh, would be the issue of climate change, 
um, because Wao Hu in 2012 said that China will actively respond to the climate change issue, Xi Jinping declared that China will be in the driver's seat for the issue. And um, among contrib contributing factors to this would be the US factor. Uh, one good example is uh, US threat to undermine the WTO and also withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. And the third shift is heightened uh, assert assertiveness because we can see in language much stronger than Hu Jintao. C have said that all acts and tricks to split China are doomed to failure and will be condemned by people and punished by history. And he, he even added, the Chinese people and Chinese nation share a common belief that no inch of our great motherland's territory can possibly be separated from China. Uh, but what's the most interesting to me is that he even cited China's building of artificial islands in South China Sea as one of his achievements during his first term. And in terms of Taiwan, he said that uh, the CCP has the resolve to defeat separatist attempts in any form. So all this indicates that um, China will become more and more assertive in defending its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and also its maritime rights in the future. And then by underscoring that a military is built to fight, C has also urged the PLA to regard combat uh, capability as criterion to meet all its work and focusing in winning wars is ever called upon. So this also indicates that they are now no longer reluctant to use military in order to defend their core interests or national interests. And then the fourth shift would be, uh, this actually shows how the Chinese elite's rising confidence in terms of their foreign policy and their um, international status. Uh, this is through the, the introduction of Xi Jinping thoughts on socialism with Chinese characteristic for the new era, where Xi Jinping has expressed belief that China would be able to present a credible alternative to liberal democracy through this new concept. And according to him, the concept has blazed a new trail for all developing countries to achieve modernization and to provide new options for other countries who want to speed up their uh, development what the future trend would be, what's likely. And um, for me, in my opinion, I think the future trend will likely to be more assertive uh, because as reflected in his um, political report. And um, this has resulted not only from structural changes, um, for example, the perceived US decline and the rising, um, the rising relative power between China, uh, of China, but also domestic consideration, mainly the nationalist legitimation of the uh, Communist Party, and also Xi's own vision and personality. But his vision for Chinese great reju rejuvenation and emergence of a strong China as a global power indicates that China needs uh, China's form, the needs of China's foreign policy to be more assertive. And um, in order to become a supreme leader like Mao Zedong and also Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping will definitely need achievement and legacy of his own. And then therefore, he will strive to ensure the realization of his vision and further consolidate his political power. And this would make trends toward assertiveness more certain. And this is particularly particularly true if we see how Xi Jinping has tightened his grip on the foreign policy of China. And a few signs of how he tightened his grip include the upgrade of the foreign policy leading small group uh, into Central Foreign Affairs Commission. And then the formation of uh, a new foreign policy team in CCP top's organ. For example, um, Yang Jiezi has been promoted into the Poly Polyburo. Wang Yi has elevated to um, state councillor and reappointed by, uh, as foreign minister. And um, Wang Qi san actually he ret retired from the PSC and he's elected as the new vice president. Um, just a typo here, sorry. So um, such form of foreign policy centralization indicates further C's imprint on China's foreign policy. And this has been affirmed by a spokesperson of Ministry of Foreign Affairs saying that President Xi Jinping thoughts are taught on diplomacy is established as an overarching guideline, providing fundamental principles and action guidance for China to implement the major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristic. So the question is, is China heading towards crisis? Well, um, I think China's assertive uh, foreign policy actually presents both opportunity and also um, challenges. In terms of opportunity, it actually will help satisfy, satisfy rising nationalist sentiment back home, and it can help to ensure the legitimation of the CCP regime. 
And in terms of challenges, it could come from those domestic challenges and external challenges. And among the challenges would include um, internal contradiction on Chinese foreign policy, where um, because as China become more active abroad, proliferation of policy actors will follow suit. And these actors, normally, they have different agenda and different interests. So it will make the central government become getting more and more difficult to reconcile these con competing uh, interests between all these agencies and also actors involved. And the second challenge could come from the BRI itself. Because as we all know, suspicions among countries along the belt and the road towards uh, BRI or towards um, China's real political intent behind the BRI present risk of blowbacks to the projects. And this is especially true if they are viewed as lining the pockets of the powerful, failing in create, uh, creating local job opportunities, as well as the issue of debt sustainabilities, which is um, like what we see in Malaysia right now. right? And um, even back in China, many have questioned why the Chinese government invested so much money abroad while many areas back in China still struggle with poverty and underdevelopment. So um, Xi Jinping and his leadership need to work really hard, not only to convince other countries about the benefit of the BRI, but also to convince its own citizen on uh, how BRI will bring benefits back to them. And um, the third challenge would be the potential breakdown in Sino-US relations. Where, um, because before this, Beijing calculates that U.S. cannot afford breakdown in this relation due to economic losses and also diminished ability to deter the North Korea. But then things might change um, in dealing with an unconventional President Trump. Okay, and then um, another one, another challenge would be on uh, maintaining a stable periphery, because uh, last year we can see uh, China almost reached a military conflict with India. Over a, over a border or territory issue. And then this issue, when combined with the issue of uh, South China Sea, etc., will um, definitely complicate China's strategic picture in the region. And last but not least, on how to manage Taiwan. Because um, Xi Jinping has set a very high expectation on the achievement of national reunification. And therefore, if the progress in terms of this reunification appears uncertain or halting, Pressure could mount on Xi Jinping to take more aggressive action. So to conclude, I think the international community will likely to see a more confident and assertive China for the next five years under Xi Jinping's leadership, uh, where they tend to use more sticks instead of carrots. But however, this does not mean that China will totally abandon the use of carrots, because the priority is still to create a benign external environment you know, to support uh, its domestic development and also to serve as a platform to consolidate uh, for the consolidation of its global leadership. And this behavior is actually a product of a complex interaction between structural factors, domestic considerations, as well as um, the leader's own perception towards the risk and opportunity given by the um, external environment. And um, despite foreign policy centralization, I believe Xi Jinping's foreign policy will continue to encounter both um, opportunity and challenges, uh, which these um, challenges, if not effectively um, tackled or managed, will certainly trip up its efforts and even lead, uh, lead to crisis. Um, that's all from me today. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to support this uh, activity of uh, the Jeffrey Chia Institute. The broad, uh, the first speaker had focus on political crisis. The second speaker had focus on external political crisis. And so I will focus on economic crisis. And when economic crisis could come from many sources, like for example, a political crisis could lead to an economic crisis. If a country breaks into civil war, clearly the economy would not, could not grow. But on the other hand, we know that you can have political crisis without economic crisis. Just look at the government in Belgium. It changes every six months, but the economy has been growing steadily that the politics is just froth on top of economic dynamism. I'm going to speak specifically on two sources 
of political, of economic crisis that could occur. One is from the U.S.-China trade war, and the other is from the large amount of bank loans that are turning bad in the Chinese financial system. So if you talk about the trade war, there are three reasons why we see it, and it is almost a mystery as why it is occurring so late. I expected one to break out in 2001, but thanks to September 11th, the Americans needed the Chinese votes in the UN for the invasion in Afghanistan, and that was a confrontation that was avoided. And as the U.S. stumbled in the Middle East, that confrontation with China has been postponed. But I think, so the last 10 years, China has made remarkable progress, and that remarkable progress has come to be interpreted as a potential threat to the national security of the United States. In other words, the complaint about unfair Chinese trade, which is that the Chinese are cheating by having an undervalued exchange rate, and that the Chinese are cheating in stealing our technology, that's been occurring for a long time. But why hasn't the trade war uh, broken out earlier? The reason is the new assert assertiveness that Dr. Shahada talked about. Basically, China now has become not so much as what they hoped that it would be, which was a strategic partner, but has emerged to become a strategic competitor. And on top of that, despite the economic damage it would do the U.S. to have such a war, the U.S. has launched the war. The war would have come even if it had not been President Trump, but Hillary Clinton. The forms may have been different. You might have less dramatic language, the finer ladies' touch, perhaps, <laughs> but there would have been a war nevertheless. So let's talk about how has it been discussed. It, there's always been this that the Chinese have been competing unfairly because you look at the accumulation of reserves by the Central Bank of China, that means that the Central Bank is buying dollars. If a Central Bank is buying dollars, then it is preventing the renminbi from appreciating by definition. Why are you buying dollars? You're buying dollars because if you don't buy it, the renminbi would appreciate. So the dollar to the renminbi is cheaper than if a free market were to exist. So it is quite natural, therefore, that the quarrel over trade relations with China has been over that the renminbi should appreciate. This is the theme song of the Peterson Institute in Washington, D.C. And it has become quite common to see in newspapers the call for a Plaza Accord II. Let us remember what is Plaza Accord I. It is not the first time that the U.S. has demanded that a foreign country appreciate its exchange rate. The first time that the U.S. has demanded it in a very big, noisy way was to the Japanese in the 1980s. In 1985, the Japanese uh, exchange rate went from 250 yuan per dollar to 125 yuan per dollar in a period of three years. That is real appreciation. And what did that do? People would think that if the Roman people would appreciate, China would sell less and the U.S. would buy less and the trade deficit should shrink. So what happened when the yuan went from, no, the yen went from 250 yen to 125? You would have expected the U.S. trade deficit to shrink. Well, what happens is the U.S. trade deficit with Japan did shrink, 
but the overall U.S. trade deficit did not shrink. Why? Because we don't live in a two-country world. The U.S. found the Japanese goods were more expensive, so they bought less. So they bought more from other countries. And in the end, the trade deficit was the same. And you look at the Japanese trade deficit, it did. The surplus with the U.S. did go down, but the surplus to Southeast Asia went up because they were setting up factories to Southeast Asia, exporting equipment to Thailand so that they could make goods and ship to the U.S. So you have a redistribution of trade deficits and trade surpluses, but no change in the overall. So what would happen if China were to appreciate the same way that the Japanese did? Since 80% of Chinese exports to the United States are manufactured by industries with foreign investment, what would happen is the foreign investment would depart and come to lovely Malaysia with our clean government and clean water. <laughs> Not clean air yet, we need Indonesia to help. But that's why Mahathir said, the U.S. trade war is great for us. It's just like the floods in Thailand five years ago was great for us, right? The floods destroyed their automobile industry, and the Japanese moved some of them here. Woe in our neighbors is good for us. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing, but anyway, it has been good for us. But what it means is, so China would certainly lose, but the U.S. would not gain because the industries would depart China, locate elsewhere, and it would sell to the U.S., and the U.S. trade deficit would remain the same. So what did the Americans do when that happened, that they found that the overall trade deficit did not change? They said, the Japanese have some, they have to appreciate even more. It's like when the doctor gives you the medicine, it doesn't work, it could be because you're not taking a big enough dosage. <laughs> or it could just be the wrong medicine. As basically, the exchange rate will not solve the problem because in the case of China, what is a trade surplus? A trade surplus occurs when you saved more than you invest. As an individual, how much you save is how much you invest. But the country as a whole, how much you save in total need not equal to the amount you invest domestically. So what do you do when you save more than what you actually end up investing domestically? You invest the rest abroad. And how do you invest the rest abroad? You export more than you import. How else do you invest abroad? You export more than you import. You get his currency, you invest in his country. So it is a big, but why does China have such high savings rate? Many reasons. One of them would be that there is a lack of social safety nets. So you need to save more in order to be able for OH, for pension. And the question is, given the amount of domestic savings, why aren't they investing it locally? Because the banks have failed to translate the domestic invest savings into domestic investment. Because it was not translated into domestic investment, it turned into foreign investment. So one thing is the Chinese saves too much, but then the banks fail in, to be able to lend out the money. Why? because the banks are happy to lend money to the state enterprises, but not to private enterprises. So there's an under lending of money, and that is spilled abroad. And at the same time, don't blame it all on China, because it's just like a marriage. You need two to tango. So the Chinese have this tendency of surplus, but the Americans have a tendency to deficit. You could see it, but the huge government budget deficit. The U.S. is fighting w several wars abroad, and fighting war, how do you pay for a war? You raise taxes. If it is 
a popular war, people are happy to pay taxes. If it is not a popular war, how do you fight the war? You borrow money from abroad. And so, given the expanding U.S. strategic involvement abroad and inability to collect taxes for political reason, because every Republican president, or rather every Republican candidate when he runs for office, what does he promise? We cut taxes. <laughs> and so, you are fighting more wars around the world, and you are cutting taxes, the only way to finance it is to borrow. And so there's a deficit tendency within the country. So to really solve the problem, you need actions in two countries, in China and in the United States. Now, let's get back to the other reason that the, the war that has happened is not so much because that the trade deficits have gotten a lot bigger and so they're more worried about it. The deficit's been hit with us since, the 19, since 1994. What has really gotten them is, they say China has been stealing our technology. Of course, stealing. What do you mean by stealing? If it is counterfeit, industrial espionage, that is stealing. Stealing, industrial espionage and so forth, is clearly illegal. And that is something you can take to court and settle. But what they are really talking is about stealing through forced technology transfer. What is a technology? What is a forced technology transfer? It is that if you have a high tech product you're gonna sell in China, China will say, "Yeah, you're welcome to sell it here, but you got to produce it in, in China, and produce it with this comp with this partner I designate, and this partner would go on and." manufacture the product with you, learn the process, and possibly emerge to be a competitor outside of the country. For example, oh, what's the, the Japanese uh, high-speed train company that worked with China to supply the first high-speed trains, Kawasaki, I think. No, it starts with K. But anyway, that uh, Japanese company, K, supplied the technology the Chinese learned it and improved markedly upon it such that it has beaten the Japanese company in bids everywhere else in the world. So the Chinese are not only capable, are not only good in copying, they actually improve it after they copy it. But that actually is good for the world because the overall technological level has been pushed forward and the final product becomes cheaper to the rest of the world. But the Chinese, uh, the Americans complain, is it a real complaint? Because when the Chinese let you to come in to, to make the good, they disallow imports by the other foreign manufacturers. So while you're making it in this country, you can sell it at a monopoly price for the product. So the American manufacturer is compensated. And is it illegal? Basically, it is true that it's being sold to China at a lower price, but it is because China has market power. Just imagine if Singapore were to say to China, you cannot sell Apple products here unless you open an Apple processing uh, research lab here. Well, Singapore, they would just bypass the Singapore market, <laughs> right? China is different because China has market power. Because when you have market power, you can ask for discounts. That's how Walmart can sell its products cheaper. Walmart squeezes a discount out from each and every one of its supplier. So is that illegal? Well, it is a monopoly buyer, so we can squeeze. How about monopoly seller? That one, we have antitrust laws. The Americans haven't quite, don't have a law against monopoly seller. No, monopoly buyer. But the important thing is in international trade, if you are the only seller of a product, there's a theory called optimal tariff. That means 
you should put a tariff to buy less, to drive the price down, and then you can buy the thing cheaper. There are many countries like that that have monopoly selling power, but they don't do it. Why? Because the victim will retaliate. And in the case of China, he has been able to do it because the U.S. has not retaliated. And why has the U.S. not retaliated? Because the American firms in the past were willing to let the Chinese have their technology because they know that newer ones are coming out from their laboratories in a few years. So as long as something new and better is coming along, I can let you steal, or rather sell it to you at a discount. Steal is the wrong word, because they actually pay for it. But just sell it at a discount. But right now, after so many years, the Chinese have come to the real frontier. What they are asking for is not something that the Americans have an easy replacement for. So that's why they are pressing the U.S. government to take action. The strongest lobby for China in U.S. Congress is American businesses. They want to produce in China cheap and sell the goods to the U.S. So that's why there has been no, uh, one reason why there's no protectionism so, so, so far is because American businesses are campaigning to keep America open. But now, given the fact that they don't have, don't have a high replacement, high tech replacement technology, they're telling the government, no, no, this time is different. So they have flipped. The American businesses have flipped, and that's why a war is happening. When you think about it, can the, can the Chinese continue to do it, this kind of method? The truth is no. Because in the war, that Trump has launched on free trade. It was not just with China, but with Europe. And now he has settled with Europe. And what is one of the deal? We are all going to stand up together against this Chinese practice of joint venture transfer of technology. So once the, the Europeans join in with the Americans, basically China has no more bargaining power. Because the bargaining power comes in, if you American firm won't give it to me, I'll get it from the Germans. But if the Germans are now standing up with the Americans, there's no, no such uh, bargaining power. And so the Chinese should gracefully give up this bargaining power now, before the inevitable, before it's taken away from them. Why? Because they are, in effect, uniting the rest of the world against themselves. So for, the present China, for some elements of the present Chinese government to continue to insist that under WTO rules, we are allowed to do this, it's true, because China is a developing country, China can do it. But on the other hand, once they are united, you cannot do it. So this uh, resistance to the U.S. demand is futile. But there's a more important reason for the trade war besides the technology. And I think what the Americans are asking is what the Chinese should actually agree to. For the simple reason, you are not going to be able to keep that market power anyway because of retaliation. So we as well be magnanimous and say, for the sake of our wonderful friendship, I give up this practice. Let us take a look, let's go back a little uh, way. You know that up until the year 2000, I would say that most of the last 200 years, the global system can be described as a system where there's a global hegemon. One country that's clearly the leader of the world. The U.S. has been the leader of the world since 1950, and before that, it was the United Kingdom. It's hard for us today to think of the United Kingdom as being a leader of the world. Well, I'll show you this. Before 1914, there are only 22, the, the, the countries in white are the only countries that the United Kingdom has not attacked in the last 100 years. 
what is being a global leader means. If people don't do what you say, you beat the heck out of them. That's how you keep discipline, and that's how you keep global coordination. You don't behave, smack. So that is global coordination towards uh, maintenance of global stability. What happens when you don't have a global leader? You get a world depression. That is the lesson that Charles Kinderberger, the, possibly the greatest economic historian of, my, of the 20th century. Why was there a great uh, re depression in 1925? There was a great depression because the leader was not able to mobilize the followers. What happened was when the, a great recession happened, some countries start putting on tariff, and every other country started putting on tariff, and the result is a common collapse. Because we all stopped buying from each other, we are all worse off. So somebody has to play the role of bailing out the failing countries and keeping its own market open. That was the role played by the United Kingdom before 1929. But by 1929, the UK was no longer the world's biggest economy. It was the United States, which was twice as big. So the US, UK was unable to play global leader, and the US was too young to understand that it should play that role. So in that interim period, in which there was no global hegemon, we got individual reaction to shocks that lead to common collapse. So. It's just like 2008. That's why we had, uh, when the global financial crisis happened, the US called together the G20 rather than the G7. Why the G20 and not the G7? Because the G7 are now no longer big enough to be able to keep the, the shock under control. So what has happened is we now have entered into an age where China is as big as the United States. There's no more global hegemon. Because you have no more he global hegemon, we stand as if we are in 1929 when a shock happened. Does it mean that in the future we're going to have a global hegemon in the case of China? The answer, you were not, the age of global hegemon is over, it will never happen. Why? Because India is coming up. India will be, in 2050, India may be 70% the income per capita, standard living of China, but the Indian population will be 30% larger than China. So China may be more productive, but India is more reproductive. <laughs> and the overall economic strength is about the same. So there'll be no more global hegemon. So what happens in a situation of this nature? Basically, we have to be able to work together. We have reached a state of the world where we either hang together or we all would hang separately, or be hung separately, rather. <laughs> So one of the big things that has to occur in order to stop the war from happening is that you need actions with the US. The US clearly has to stop telling China to do something that will not work, always telling China to appreciate its currency, just like it told the Japanese to appreciate its currency. And the Chinese say, why are you telling me to do things that will hurt me and not benefit you? Right? So that, that certainly makes no sense. Basically, there has to be real factors. The real factors are the U.S. got to cut its government budget deficit. Then that will help reduce this trade deficit. And the Chinese have to figure out how to get a normal banking system, a banking system that actually lends money to the private sector so that its domestic savings is translated into domestic investment and not spill over as external investment. And Trump, that is already done when I wrote this, basically is getting the Japanese 
which are very keen to join in retaliation against China at anything on, on any subtopic, but the G7 in general. In the case of China, China has to recognize that it cannot say, you've got to treat us according to WTO rules. China actually has to take a less generous position for itself because China is not a typical developing country. There are very few developing countries that has got market power in purchase and sales of its products. China is not a typical country. It's the biggest donor in Africa. So because of that, China has a role of, be, of participating in global governance, a place which it seeks and wants. And for that, the basis of interaction is reciprocity. And reciprocity means that China would have to give up on many of these practices that it adopts because it is a developing country. And I would argue that it is to China's advantage to do so. And I was going to talk about the second thing, but if you are interested, we'll talk about it in Q&A. So let me invite the other two speakers to come forward so that uh, we are, uh, they could answer your questions to their brilliant presentations. Peter, Dr. Shahada, please. My name is Tan. Dr. Yang, I want to ask a very simple question. How do you become a member of the Communist Party in China? I'm, I'm Li. Uh, I just want to ask you, the, can you please elaborate further on the Petro Yuan and the China project, China manufacturing? Oh, well, China is a country before its time, usually. Uh, particularly, I, I worked in China for six years uh, before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you were yeah, non-performing loans. I think non, that's very non interesting. Non-performing loans. Yeah. Okay. okay, we have three questions. Let's talk about membership. I'm sure you're not a member yet, but uh, all, all of us are interested. There's an interesting question. I've never been asked about this before. Uh, it's actually not an easy process. Uh, you have to show that you have political um, quality. Right? You need a party member to recommend you first. It's not about well, you can join, but you need someone to second you. It cannot be just on your own. That someone will second you, you of course you fill out the form, everything, after that person thinks that you are, you are good, and then you will have a period of probation in which they will watch and see how much you are really committed to the ideas of being a member of the Communist Party. And finally, you will join as a member of a particular party cell. Uh, is a party small branch. That is the lowest level. Right? So then you will start from there and then if you work your way up, you could be a party secretary in a larger committee and so on and so forth. That is basically the process. And it's actually not easy in the sense that many people think that it's easy to join. It's not that. Now the party is very stringent in terms of uh, the suits, the quality of the members. They don't want uh, party members who have no knowledge, you know. In the past, the party has these characteristics of being a party of the peasant, of the worker, so the requirement is a little bit lower. But now, they basically wants the party to, it's, it's not a typical communist party, it's a party of the elite in a sense, right? They want the best educator, they want, the, they want you to have the knowledge, to have the techno you know, information technology, all these things, right? And on top of that is a political uh, commitment. So. That is my short answer. I think your, that gentleman's questions about uh, the Made in China 2025 better to be addressed by Professor Wu. Well, Malaysia has the five-year plan, aspirations. Every country has aspirations. So it's said because the important thing in life is not how fast you do it, but the direction in which you move. If you're moving the wrong direction, it doesn't matter what the speed is. China clearly wants to become a technologically advanced country. That in itself is not a bad thing. Because technology, by, by coming up with new technology, there's cheaper 
and in better than existing ones, we are all going to have a higher standard of life. The United States uh, appears to, to be feel threatened by it, but that's not the right response. You don't become a strong country by holding back the other country technologically. In other words, the US, one US uh, response is, we won't sell high-tech products to China. That's the response. So that China, it's as if China cannot figure out how to do it, but China will do it maybe a little later because they don't get the learning. But the more important thing is how can I maintain my lead? How can the US maintain its lead? It is, you got to have a really good education system, especially in STEM, science, technology, E is what? Engineering and math, right? In the US, if you go to any a, a uni, good university, all the law schools are full of white and black and yellow Americans. And the engineering departments are full of white, black, and yellow foreigners. The education system in STEM at the primary, secondary school is simply disgraceful. This is where they have failed. But they have not always failed. Because when they were challenged by the Soviet Union, when, uh, when, uh, after the Sp Sputnik crisis, the American responded, and they were able to uh, galvanize the people and turn them into uh, first-rate engineers and so forth. So that is what the Americans need to do. But if you look at what the government has been doing, it's been cutting expenditure on research and on education all around. They said, let the private sector fix it. Let the private education uh, uh, sector do it. That means that you'll be make sure that if talent is randomly distributed, if we can make the same assumption that poor people have the same academic potential as rich people, then basically you have just reduced the number of high performance individuals who would get educated. So the Americans' response to China 2025 has been largely a wrong-headed one, which is that to deny the Chinese the, the right to import high-tech goods and so forth. And I think uh, at, at, so that, and the petro yuan, I don't know enough about it. Uh, we'll set up a private consulting talk, call on that one. Uh, I think probably this, Dr. No Shahada, you mentioned about the in increasing assertiveness of China. How do you interpret the military efforts or uh, building of, of uh, the islands and arming them and building more aircraft carriers and so on and, and modernizing the army? Is it a case of China wanting to protect its territory or is it a question of China uh, moving out of its zone, comfort zone? Uh, as well, in, in the case of Africa, they have acquired sources of commodities through their investment in inverted commerce. How do you see this effort in the South China Sea? Uh, what does it reflect of the Chinese policy? Andrew from uh, Sunway University. Uh, yesterday, uh, President Xi had a uh, meeting with uh, a number of um, officials and uh, learned academics. Uh, to reflect upon the performance of BRI in the past five years. Uh, as a principal, he said that moving forward, perhaps the BRI has already more or less built up uh, the key outreach that it needs to, and now they need to focus on the finer details. Uh, and when they talk about the finer details, they're talking about uh, some uh, things like uh, quality development in their infrastructure, uh, development that actually uh, benefits the local people, more social responsibility, uh, more environmental protection. I'd like to ask the panelists, uh, do you think that 
uh, China is perhaps changing the way it is uh, approaching BRI uh, because it is genuinely taking feedback from uh, the other participating countries like Malaysia, uh, whereby some of the projects earlier on may not have been fully for the benefit of the local people. Or is it because of their internal crisis where uh, they may have been outreaching too much, uh, spending too much overseas, leading to uh, uh, stress in their banking system? Thank you. Um, in terms of the South China Sea, like, um, I think it's both, you know, um, in order to really obtain control over the disputed waters, uh, you have to establish your presence. So by presence, not only by patrolling the area, but it would be best if we uh, establish um, like administration, uh, administrative um, center or should I say? Structure, yeah, structure uh, in the disputed waters. And then um, the other thing is that um, I would not say to threaten other, other claimants, you know, but it's like um, giving hints to them that, you know, don't mess with China in this area because our military are patrolling this area. This area belongs to us because they keep on saying that um, the South China Sea belongs to China no matter what is undisputable. This is the Chinese perspective. So um, I think it's both. First is to establish uh, actual control. And second is to send signal to other claimants that don't um, create tensions or challenge our, our sovereignty in this area. I think that's the reason why behind these artificial island buildings and also the speed up in military modernization in um, the case of South China Sea. Yep. And um, in terms of BRI? Um, in terms of BRI, I think, yeah, it could be, um, like I've mentioned in my presentation earlier, because um, China are face, facing backlash not only from the um, states along the Belt and the Road, such as Malaysia, but also from the Chinese, local Chinese citizens themselves. So um, I would think that maybe they're um, adjusting their approach in terms of BRI so that they can overcome these um, challenges. I'm not sure if um, Dr. Niao has something to add on this. All right, I answer about the BRI part. Um, it's true that uh, there are several cases, uh, high profile cases, and Malaysia just at the club, <laughs> just joined the club of uh, trying to uh, um, have this so called backlash against uh, China's uh, projects. Uh, but why, why this happened? is also something that uh, we have to figure out and China also have to figure out and not just the participating countries. I think it actually China misunderstood one thing. And if you look at the, their policy papers on the BRI, the most authoritative paper or document is the vision and action document issued in 2015. And then all the rest is the derivative of that particular document. And if you look at that document, is really very general. There's no, specific, no specifics it's talking about main principles. And why does China want to do that? Is that they want to retain certain kind of flexibility. So if you want, if you ask China, do you have a BRI blueprint? There's never a blueprint. They can't even come out with a list of uh, projects that are, list, that are categorized as BRI and in Malaysia. They haven't done yet. And Malaysia has been asking for many years. And there's a reason why they cannot do it, because there's not an official blueprint kind of thing. It's, it's always more prioritized over this uh, flexibility. The reason they do this is that they try to cater to the, each individual country the kind of projects they need, and then see whether they fit. So I would say that it's not necessarily come of a bad intention. It's good intention in the sense that I want to cater to your local conditions what kind of projects? So there's never a blueprint. Now, in order to do that, the vision and action documents say that there is this principle of gong sang, gong jian, gong xiang. Ma. Discuss together, build together, share together. And they thought that with this, they solve the problem. Now, the problem is the very first word, discuss together. Who do you discuss together? So they discuss with Najib. So they discuss with Raja Pasa. So they discuss with the leaders they thought have the integrity and legitimacy in their own country. So they haven't really figured that out that in their very basic document, the discuss together is already running into certain kind of ambiguity and could lead them into problems. So in the past, Chinese approach is basically power. I call it power holders approach. I approach whichever 
countries, whoever is in power is the legitimate government entity that I'm dealing with. They have uh, basically overlooked another approach as, that I would term as stakeholders, that they are actually more than other, other stakeholders in this country, more than the power holders. So the backlash come from this. When these power holders are kicked out from power, then these projects become problems. Right. So I think Xi Jinping, when he said that China needs to consolidate, it's the time to reflect that from the very beginning, the Gong, Gong Sang, the Discuss Together, has to undertake not just uh, power holders, but inclusive of the stakeholders. So I think that is what they are trying to learn now. Right. That would be my brief response. Hi. Uh, my name is Mani Wanyan. Uh, just two questions. Uh, the first one is, by 2049, you know, China has this plan, right? Uh, do you think they are thinking of becoming the next superpower or, you know, the next protector of the world? You know, there is a sense that U.S. is not no longer going to be uh, the superpower, you know, to protect the world because they need to start looking domestically, you know, taking care of their own citizens. So is there any intentions or signs that China seems to want to play that role, or at least in this part of the world? One. Uh, second one would be... China is, the government has been so against corruptions, they've been taking severe penalties about corruptions and all that. But then how did they allow, like for example in Malaysia, in our own home, uh, there are companies coming here and actually involved in corruption activities. I mean, we can clearly see agreement signs are one-sided, not fairly done. Uh, there must have been a lot of, well, you put it, anky-panky things has happened. So. Recently, our premier went and uh, had a discussion with them. I'm sure at a higher level, they noticed that. Do you think there certain actions will be taken to correct? Uh, I guess this is what uh, Dr. Wu said just now, the fault in the structural of their policy or whatever it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shumi Bao from University of Michigan. And it's interesting to see there is uh, such a large audience uh, interested in, in the China's the crisis. So my question is, uh, if China is handing into a real crisis, what kind of potential impact on Malaysia, positive or negative impact? Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Nicholas Chan from uh, Monash University. And it's a question for all the panelists, and it's where do environmental issues fit into your analysis, because in, in foreign policy terms, you know, China likes to present itself now as a ecologically responsible, you know, committed to the Paris Agreement where the U.S. is not. And yet, on the other hand, its challenges in actually leveling or reducing its greenhouse gas emissions, right, and sort of still being reliant on heavy industry, on, on lots of brown energy. Um, and we also see that brown energy in its some of its BRI type initiatives, right? F funding lots of coal and oil and gas in uh, Central Asia in particular. Um, so is there a tension there? Um, and more broadly, how, how do environmental issues fit into kind of the analysis you've provided? Thanks. Um, okay, I'll take the question on whether uh, China want to like um, challenge U.S. hegemon or, and become the next hegemon in the international system. Um, I think at this moment, um, Maybe not, because China keep on insisting that they are still far lagging behind the United States in terms of their um, defense budget and then their, their economy. They're the second largest economy and in terms of defense. Um, and um, they, are, they are being very keen in uh, promoting multilateral, uh, multipolarity, multipolar, polarism. Yes. Um, but in terms of, uh, in this region, like say in... Um, the East Asia region, region. Uh, I think probably um, they have that kind of intention because uh, through the BRI, th we have this saying that all road leads to Beijing, right? So in terms of uh, maybe this region, maybe yes, they, they want to like um, emerge as a leader, but I don't think that they, they have this intention at this moment to challenge US hegemon, right? Thank you. About corruption. Uh, yes, as I mentioned, China has, uh, under Xi Jinping, has launched a very uh, unprecedented uh, anti-corruption drive and is still ongoing and has targeted many officials and has many officials have been disciplined and put into jail and whatever. Uh, but the questions about why China seemingly is doing or allowing corruption uh, to happen in overseas. Um, that is the first thing is that corruption in China has this political dimension, 
uh, there's no denying. But on the other hand, we should not push this point too far, saying that it's all about politics and nothing about building the institution. I think both go hand in hand. But in a foreign dimension, generally there is less restraint on that one. It's more talk, considering first China national interest. If working with a corrupt leader does not necessarily undermine China's national interest, right, it may have a more lax way of dealing with these kind of issues. The second thing is that it's not clear to them what kind is this corruption in the Chinese eyes. It is corruption in our eyes. All right? Let's say all the allegations are true, money are siphoned off to benefit a certain individuals. But for the China's entity who is going out there, I follow all the agreements and follow all the terms that have been asked by the foreign leader to me. And it's not that I'm pocketing. I don't think any of the executives in this case of the Chinese side are pocketing on their, in their own pockets. It's not a corruption to them. right? There is no similar kind of US uh, anti-bribery law. There is something like that. But I don't think China has that yet, has developed into that yet. All right, the second about the uh, China, will China, if China is like a protector, and what, what will it be? It's actually a very, I don't know, strange question. <laughs> because, but I think China generally still doesn't like to play the kind of role that US is playing in terms of um, asking people to adopt certain kind of practices and standards. It, it, it is behaving in certain way like the Americans a lot more now because it's becoming bigger, but it has its own way of dealing with this, and we can see this in terms of a number of regional issues, international issues, from in Africa to Myanmar to every case, that basically China still maintain a hands-off approach. They think that all these issues are just better to be resolved by the locals. Any foreign interference will just aggravate rather than actually help to reduce uh, the issues. No matter how brutal and unjust it is, there is very little the foreign power can do. This is China's views, anyway. Um, environmental. Um, yes, uh, China actually is, uh, well, in developing environmental uh, or replacing the, the, the so-called uh, unclean energy with clean energy, actually it's, China is in the forefront of doing that. But yet it's not fast enough, maybe in the eyes of, man, in the eyes of many, that uh, it cannot one, in one generation replace all the dirty technology with the green technology. It's, so it's still doing that. Um, and then actually under Xi Jinping, on the domestic side, there has been a lot more emphasis on environment protection. Uh, in the past, officials can say that I develop first and then I protect the environment and can get away with it. Now, under the officials' KPIs in their own domestic, uh, uh, the, in their evaluations of the officials, environmental component has been included as part of the a criteria to assess uh, officials in terms of promotion and everything. This was not done before Xi Jinping. And under Xi Jinping, this has been included. Right? So they are actually trying to be uh, more uh, active in terms of protecting the environment. But anyway, ultimately, it comes, I think, in my view, comes to still national interests in the sense that you do it when you can. But if it comes into conflict, let's say, of energy security, Right? Why are you still relying on coal? Because coal is a reliable security, uh, energy security. On, on that front, they will still prioritize their other security in opposed to environmental protection. So that will be my answer. I think oh. Paul Fu can add further insights. Oh, no. Uh, well, the question is whether China will protect her or not. I don't know about protect her, but the question is, would China obey international law? You ask yourself, if a country does not, would a country that does not obey its own law be willing to observe international law? I think that is the fundamental question. And you could say may, the rule of law has been strengthened in China under Mr. Xi Jinping. So, on the question of, is the person who asked the question about loan still here? Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, lo bad loans means that there are people who have borrowed money and they cannot pay it back. And if uh, the amount of bad loans is larger than the capital that the bank has, then the bank is bankrupt, right? And what would happen in bankruptcy? Would there be a financial market meltdown? 
Like for example, when people realize the bank is bankrupt, would they run and ask for the deposits back? And the, and, the, and the bank would disappear. I can say quite confidently, even if 50% of the loans go bad, I think now it's around 10, even if it is 50%, there'll be no financial market meltdown in China. Why do I say that? A bank that's bankrupt, but yet there's no financial market meltdown, like the Lehman Brothers, the reason is because the banks are all owned by the government. Can the government afford to pay what the bank owes? Given the huge amount of state asset that the government possesses, or if it is willing to privatize a lot of its assets, yes, it could pay off whatever the banks owe. So the question is really, would there be a financial crisis? That is if the government doesn't have the financial firefighting power. And what is financial firefighting power? To be able to pay people back for what you owe them, the depositors in particular. And the Chinese government is solvent, so it can do it. So does it mean that there's no danger in the bad debts? There's huge danger in the bad debts. Not in the sense of a financial crisis would happen, but that the first big thing is it could result in a lower growth rate and it results in an income distribution that is worse than what otherwise. Why do I say that? How is the bad debt created in the first place? The most common way for bad debt to, to be created is I borrow the money and I invest it in something that was stupid and I wasted the capital. Because the capital is wasted, when it could have been invested in something productive, the final growth rate is lower than what it otherwise would have been. Like for example, you look at the number of ghost cities in China. All those empty cities are wasted investment, which have been invested elsewhere and have resulted in a greater growth. But that is not the reason why most of the bad debts occur. It is not because China's been investing in garbage. That's why there are bad debts. If they're investing in garbage, you have collapsed because you have wasted the capital. The reason that they are bad debts is because the person who borrowed it had transferred the asset to outside of his company. The people who borrow it are the state-owned enterprises. If the project succeeds, the manager through accounting identities, it doesn't need much creativity as you learn in Malaysia to steal money. After you've stolen the money, you cannot repay the bank loan. And if the government is willing to write off the debt, so much the better. <laughs> so. A lot of the bad debts in China is stolen money. That's why the debt went bad. So I'm not saying all of it because there's the wasted investment that makes the growth lower. And that's just, that's just stolen money, which are stolen by the state-owned enterprise managers. After all, when people talk about state-owned, and, and that's why the state banks don't mind lending to state-owned enterprises because when the state enterprises don't pay it back, the government said, never mind, it's one of us. <laughs> it's just like Bank Pumiputra, Malaysia. How many times was this bailed out successively? What do bank, what do all these uh, qualified individuals who went to the best business schools around the world, but how come the companies they run, they still lose money? Most of this is not a management issue. It is the incentive within the system. If you lose money, the state will bail you out. If you make money, there's all kinds of ways you can steal it. It's just like uh, in Malaysia today, we confront the question of the GLCs. Many people see it as a management problem, which is like, the, uh, and many people ask, why wasn't Rome built in one day? 
the answer for many people is because I was not in charge. Lah. <laughs> it's, it's not because it was the system that allowed all these terrible things to happen. What do state enterprise managers find it more better to do in Malaysia than to go pay attention to, to, to their work? It is to sing Hibatla Malaysia as a group. There is this famous video that has been circulated. So you could see that So the, the outcome is lower growth and worse income distribution. What is really dangerous is that the Chinese would never develop a modern banking sector. Why? In order for Shanghai to become an uh, international global center, you have to let foreign banks come in. But if you've got a lot of NPLs among your domestic banks, you cannot let the foreign banks come in. A simple example will illustrate this. Suppose my bank has $100 million worth of deposits, $100 million worth of deposits, and the de interest rate on deposit is 1%. So I have to come up with $1 million each year to pay my depositors. Suppose my cost of operating the bank is also $1 million. So my total cost, interest payment plus operational cost is $2 million. So what is the minimum loan rate I must charge to lend out the money? 2%, right? Because I make, if I charge loan rate of 2%, I make $2 million, I cover all my costs. Suppose I lend out at 2% and $50 B million went bad. $50 million said they cannot pay me back. The other $50 million are well performing. What, how much interest rate should I charge now? Because what's my cost? My cost is $2 million. I got only 50 that's performing. I must now charge 4%. If I let a foreign bank comes in, he takes deposit of $100 million, he pays 1% uh, uh, deposit rate, and his operating cost also $1 million, how much would the foreign bank charge? 2%. So what happens to me? I'm history. So I cannot let foreign banks come in. And because I cannot let foreign banks come in, you will now become a global financial center. You may become a money laundry center like Singapore. <laughs> but I, I don't, and, and the Roman B cannot be internationalized. The non-internationalization Roman B is very dangerous for China. Why has Iran agreed to give up the nuclear bomb? Because the world payment system is a US dollar based payment system. When the US wants to squeeze you, it puts financial sanctions. You cannot engage in international trade. You cannot engage in international trade. That's finished. So it means that China is vulnerable to being blackmailed if it does not get the Roman P internationalized and escape from the dollar denominated payment system. And for as a matter of global welfare, the more international reserve currency, the better, because it allows risk diversification. So uh, the non-paying loans, the one that's commonly discussed, there will be a financial market blowout meltdown, people panic uh, asking for the deposits, that will never happen. If the Chinese are willing to privatize their assets, like if they want to sell one of the big four banks, like ABC, Agriculture Bank, Citibank will buy it, HSBC will buy it. So you could see that the, the, there will not be a financial crisis, but the bad loans will lead to slower growth rate because of wasted investment, Worse income distribution because of uh, st the stealing by the rich. Thanks for the opportunity for me to have a last question. Um, I'm Randy, a Malaysian currently studying in Peking University in China. And then I, I have a question, actually, it's like a broad question. Uh, I need some Malaysian perspective, like from a scholar, to evaluate the current Chinese foreign policy since uh, our Prime Minister Mahathe visited to China and met Premier and President Xi Jinping. So is that the 
P our PM visit to China, is that a game changing in the China foreign policy or just like simply a continuation of the Chinese foreign policy? So I just need yeah some views from Malaysian scholar perspective. Thank you. Whether it's a game changer, I have no really know. <laughs> um, I think it set the tone of what Malaysia-China relations will be in the future years. That uh, Dr. M, I think, is very clear that he will not be someone who is easily gouty, like Najib. I think uh, China now sees that very clearly. Uh, but he has also been learning lessons uh, from other places. That's why there is this uh, uh, meeting that that just now one uh, gentleman from the audience mentioned that they need to recalibrate how they conduct their foreign policy. Uh, today, I think sometimes they mistaken the word as very simplistic. It's, they actually have a very good understanding, but in a way, they always see in a very clear, uh, uh, not clear, but um, as I said, power, uh, power holders approach. They always define the whole country in terms of who holds the power because it's how they operate in their own country. So this, to the point of neglecting the complexity of other countries that can change very fast. And even if they have, their own scholars have been saying that, well, you have to slow down and look into this one, but sometimes their own push away. When China say, go out, there's certain mechanism that result in the, in the tendency to overlook uh, or slow down. Uh, I'm not... Uh, Sure, I'm phrasing it right. For example, why are there so drastic push for all these projects? I suspect one of the reason is that there are KPI for all these all these SOEs that you have to go and uh, establish how many footprints, markets, all these things. So there is a natural tendency for China to go very gung ho. So the fast past five years of BRI is like that. Now that is dangerous in the sense that, as I say, you think that when these companies go all go out, they just think that. I doubt him the the the, the atau is okay. They neglect to have a comprehensive overall risk assessment done in a proper way. That has invited backlash. So you see the major projects, the forest city or everything, is everyone is everything is gautim, uh, just gautim, Joho Sultan, Gautim Najin and Gautim. <laughs> so I think that it's time for them to learn that things will not work all uh, to, their, to their own best interest and to the interest of the countries that are receiving uh, this kind of uh, uh, projects as well. So I think that could be a message that Dr. M uh, is signaling to the Chinese that, well, foreign countries are not easily gouty, actually. <laughs> okay, um, if I may add a little bit, um, I think basically the relations between um, China and Malaysia, it will remain um, basically the same. We we'll still maintain our friendly relations. But then in terms of the BRI, I think um, Mahathir administration is more um, stern, you know. Uh, they will make sure that um, this initiative or the, the projects that we sign up with these Chinese uh, companies will really benefit us. Because um, for the current government, um, they would think that this ECRL and um, the, the projects that they have cancelled is not beneficial to the Malaysian citizen at all. So why would we waste this kind of money to build this kind of major, mega projects, but um, which like it won't it won't benefit us. So uh, in the future, I think we are still um, collaborate with China in terms of these projects, but we will make sure that this project is beneficial. And um, one of the potential uh, projects would be um, the Pan-Asia Railway, which uh, will stretch from um, the south towards the uh, north. And then um, if, uh, you know, if you want to know more about this, maybe you can um, read um, an article written by Dr. Kui Ting Tui and also our um, Deputy Defense Minister, Liu Jin Tong, on uh, Mahathir Doctrine. So they have elaborated um, in details on, on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the final word is clearly if the Chinese wants to do well in the, if they want to do well, not just do good, they would have to understand Southeast Asia better. Specifically, the, the ambassador, for example, interfered in Malaysia's uh, political election. He went to Aya Itam and a campaign for the, can uh, for the MCA candidate there. <laughs> and uh, you see the picture. Uh, while pictures of Mahathir are cut off from election posters because under regulation, only the local candidate is supposed to appear. But then you see Xi, Xi Jinping running all over the 
poster all over the country shaking Liu Tianlai's hand, uh, Liu, Liu Tianlai's hand, right? He's running for in the Malaysian election as well. The Chinese embassy should not have allowed that. They should have understood us better, and this shows a lack of uh, sophistication and understanding of how the world works. Well, I think we should thank our brilliant speakers for the wonderful presentations. And thank you all for coming and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.